Welcome, welcome, welcome. So nice to see everyone. Yes, beautiful familiar faces and some new folks. Welcome to the Well of Being Wednesday here at the Sarasco Dharma Collective. This is our time every week to gather together and really have this beautiful opportunity to focus in and connect with this stream of teachings. I, I, I sometimes think about it. These teachings, especially the ones we're working with tonight, these are from the eighth century. And they have been shared and shared and shared freely over all that time. And that we get to engage with them and find their relevance here and now is just, it's so beautiful. And though I myself, I love a good evidence base, a scientifically informed intervention, if something has lasted since the eighth century, <laughs> there's a different kind of evidence base, right? There's a relevance and importance of these teachings, the reason they've been shared so often. And tonight we're continuing on in this beautiful text, the guide to the Bodhisattva way of life. If this is your first night, no problem. The essential kind of pith description of this text is how do we cultivate the pliancy of mind and the strength of heart that allows us to be fully open as compassion warriors with a world that's on fire. Oh my God, Josh, missed you so much. Welcome. I'm so happy you're back. Please find a seat. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> I feel that about everyone. Sorry. Didn't know. It but really, remember Josh? He's been gone for months. Anyway, nice to see you. So in the in this training to be a bodhisattva, the main author of this text is Shanti Deva. And so he gave this, you know, in these prose, and the prose are very provocative. They're intended to kind of, in some ways, kind of slap us awake. Like we don't have any time. This is what is needed. This world is on fire. We have to do this now. So kind of relevant for right now, right? Still has that poignancy. And what's interesting too, is we have the secondary text by Pema Chodron who many of you know, and probably many of you love, and she helps with a bit more of a kind of contemporary psychological lens on this text. And I do think a lot of what is included in this text is quite actionable. The first three chapters that we already covered are how do we become excited and inspired to all become bodhisattvas, to take this vow. And it is an insane vow. Like the vow of the bodhisattva is not only to wake up for the sake of all beings, so to have as your core inspiration in every activity you do, whether it's eating in order to provide nourish nourishment, whether it's actually directly service to others, like in everything you do, the motivation is, may this be of service for all beings to wake up. That in and of itself is, is beautiful. And then all beings, not just those we already know and care about, but all beings. And that requires this kind of wearing down of our habitual tendencies to just think about those we already care about. Number one, us, right? And then those that we already have a preference for. So that's already pretty insane. Like, let me open my heart, not only to the suffering in my world, which I don't know about all of you, there's plenty of suffering in my world, you know, for me to have care for and to feel um, engaged with. It's actually to open it up to all beings. And part of the reason this is done, and you're back to welcome, is in order to exercise the heart past the normal boundaries. This idea that, oh, I only have this much care. If I care any more than this, I, I will be overwhelmed. That's actually a point of view and a stance. And many of us fall into it. Often when I offer these teachings on the guide to the Bodhisattva, I get this question of, I'm already tired and worn out. Like, how could I actually offer more to more people? And there's an invitation here to actually observe this paradox where when we open the heart all the way, all the way, all the way, and even farther, there's actually more space for all of it. More space for those in our, you know, immediate life that we care about in their suffering and more space for 
all others. And it's not as though we then kind of relinquish all of our worldly goods and you know, strike out to try to end one of the many uh, afflictions of our time. It's just how are we orienting everything we're doing? How are we orienting our mind towards our activities and behaviors? And what's interesting about this is this idea, this kind of altruistic motivation, not only is it good for the world, who certainly needs support, or many beings do, it's good for us. So this very famous quote by the Dalai Lama, if you want others to be happy, practice compassion. If you want to be happy, practice compassion. And we know that to be true. Some of our most meaningful experiences are in service of others. But what makes this even crazier, this vow of the Bodhisattva, is it's not just all beings, right? That's a lot. It's all beings for all time, for eternity. So I vow to do this not only in this lifetime, which is pretty challenging, but every single lifetime that I come back, I will come back and do this again and again and again until all beings are free. And even if, you know, you're not sure where you stand on lifetimes, are there many, is it just this one? The poetry of that, like the beauty of that, that that could be underlying our motivation of how we approach the world. That's the kind of way that these bodhisattva practices tenderize the heart. And tonight we're going to continue, uh, we started last week focusing on attentiveness, which can also be considered, you know, this mindful awareness. And the metaphor that Pema Chodron gave last week, which I loved, is this kind of attentiveness that you have when you're walking very close to a steep cliff. So imagine you're out at Fort Funston and there's a steep cliff below you. You're not kind of wandering around in your mind, right? You are clear on what's happening. You know where your steps are. And bringing this attentiveness to the mind helps us observe and become clear on what knocks us off our path. So last week we talked a bit about kleshas and shempa. Kleshas being just that, you know, kind of difficult, sticky, emotional experience we have. Very often craving something or not wanting something. And shempa is just the kind of energy and the charge with that. That occupies a lot of our mental space, right? Don't want this, do want that. And when we have the attentiveness, when we start being able to cultivate a, a real sense of what's happening in our mind, those won't go away. We'll still be triggered, there'll still be difficult things, but there's a bit more room to work with what arises for us. An opportunity to maybe feel compassion towards that, maybe not get so kind of pulled into rumination for quite as long. And last week, we returned to the beautiful uh, practice of Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche with the three precious pills. And in, the, in those practices, we're settling the body, speech and mind into their natural states as a way to cultivate the attentiveness. And I will kind of highlight those again. But as promised last week, I, I thought it would be meaningful for us to do a meditation on Vedana, or what's called the Vedana practice. And this is a practice in which we go from really being aware of sensations in the body, which many of us practice all the time, to being aware of the particular kind of experience, or you could say judgment or qualification we have. So there are sensations in the body that we attribute to being pleasant, unpleasant, or somewhere in between. Sometimes that's called neutral. There's a little debate as to whether we can really experience neutrality, right? Maybe it's a little less pleasant, maybe a little more unpleasant. And what's so interesting about Vedana practice is it starts to help us see the way that we create the reality around us as opposed to the reality as it is. So for many of us here, we read Old Path White Clouds last year, I think, maybe maybe last year, which is the historical life of the Buddha and right where all these teachings on the four foundations of mindfulness actually arise throughout Buddha's life. He didn't just kind of wake up and all the teachings appeared, right? It's as he met all these different challenges of how do I explain awakening to all these people that they arose. And Vedana practice is such an important and essential practice of the Satipatthana Sutta, 
of developing our foundations of mindfulness. Because we start to recognize that we get so hooked, we get so kind of pulled into seeking pleasantness and avoiding unpleasantness. And we don't realize it's often just something we're creating, something we're placing onto. And the goal of this practice in some way is to really see that we're creating the realities we live in, imposing that sense of unpleasantness, seeking the pleasantness in, in our experience, wanting to hold on to it. Whereas what we could be observing is that these are occurring and then they're fading and they can change all the time. So when we're having an unpleasant experience, in some ways it feels like the entirety of our life. Like, oh man, this is really bad. Everything's bad. It'll always be bad. That's in some ways how our mind and body system is wired. So in this practice, like many of the mindfulness practices, we develop an attentiveness to really notice how we impose this idea of how reality is onto reality itself. There's another really nice part of this practice where we're trying to recognize <clears throat> kind of the spark before the flame. So often we recognize the unpleasantness right before it becomes maybe an overwhelming thought or feeling or sensation. So this practice has a, a number of different levels. The way that I'll guide us tonight is we'll start with the body and noticing sensations in the body that feel pleasant or unpleasant and neutral. And we label these. We don't go into like a whole story and dialogue of unpleasant, like, of course it's unpleasant. You know, yesterday I knocked my knee on the side of the whatever, right? Not a story about the unpleasant, just a simple noting, a simple labeling, that's unpleasant. That feels pleasant. And because our bodies are, you know, dynamically shifting and changing, even if we're not moving, there's quite a lot of material for us to label. But then we get into the other juicy material of our thoughts. When our thoughts arise, some of them we think are pleasant. Many of them <laughs> we think are unpleasant. And then some of them are just coming and going, right? Like, is the fan on in here? Hopefully that's not, well, it could be pleasant. Maybe it could be unpleasant. And we start to also label mental formations. So I hope you can see how this practice is such an interesting one for attentiveness really kind of bringing like the full force of our attention to noticing, you know, the experiences that we have right as they arise. Does that sound exciting to you guys? Mm -hmm. Sorry for the extensive preamble. If there's one more seat in here, it looks like is someone, well, I think it's right just in front of the, Okay. <laughs> May all beings be free, except no one else can come in here. There we go. Sweet. Oh yeah, it's not creepy. And one thing to say, especially for folks I haven't seen here before, is the Dharma Collective is entirely volunteer run, meaning that we exist here because of the generosity of everybody who's here, and that each of you who is here tonight, you are also giving us so much of your precious time and your presence. So the gift of being here is, is really wonderful. And especially for folks who are here for the first time and you don't know the space, like really take your time and, and look around, make yourself feel oriented. Mace, as you can tell, is a wonderfully compassionate, fierce protector at the door. So you can be at ease and being with new people um, or even being with familiar people can be awkward. So giving yourself a moment to feel settled in this space. Sometimes we do that by just looking around in a non creepy way at one another. What a generosity of our time to be here together. Thanks everyone for showing up. Thanks friends online. Love y'all. All right, so do whatever is needed for you to find a posture that can support you for this practice. <laughs> Which doesn't include going and getting tea or anything like that, just something here. Yep, if you need to stand up for a moment. You can double up on the cushions, I find that helps. Do you want one of these guys? 
These are like a little easier on, on the tush. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're working with body, so you'll get some sensations. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm of the belief here. I'm, I don't know if I said this. I'm Eve, by the way. Um, <laughs> I'm definitely of the belief that meditation shouldn't hurt in your posture. Some traditions work with that and I totally respect it, but slight movements and adjustments, wonderful. If especially you become aware of that's unpleasant, I wanna move and bring mindfulness throughout the entire movement. Really wonderful. All right. So finding a balance between a sense of uprightness, vividness, almost as though we could breathe from the very base of our spine up to the crown of our head. And with that, experience a sense of lengthening and lightening. And then feel and connect to a sense of ease and relaxation through the exhale. Softening through the face and the chest and the belly. And for the next three breaths, seeing if you can lengthen that inhale, that sense of drawing upwards, finding the vividness. And then exhale, relaxing, releasing, and settling in. These first moments of practice, we really notice the fullness of mind. And without making that a problem whatsoever, we shift and invite our attention and awareness into the body. Allowing our attention and awareness to fill the space of the body completely. And connecting to the quality of stillness in the body. Every single time we get carried away, we get to plant a new seed by returning our attention and awareness to this moment. Connecting to the sensations of the body from within the body and inviting this quality of the body in its natural state, finding the stillness
And to help settle the mind, settle the speech, we bring our attention and awareness to the breath. <clears throat> Letting our attention ride the breath, like riding a horse. Our attention being the rider, and the breath comes in and out. Noticing the subtle undulation. Again, making distraction not a problem whatsoever. In fact, seeing if your first response can be to relax, and then release, and then returning as we follow the breath, even one breath at a time, and inviting this quality of speech to feel in a natural state of silence. It doesn't mean no thoughts arise. It's where we're choosing to place our attention and awareness to the space between the thoughts, inner dialogue. So continuing to connect with silence by following the breath. <clears throat> without striving or pushing too hard. See how precise your attention and awareness can be upon the breath. And resting our attention and awareness on the subtle sensations of breath can bring a brightness, a vividness to our awareness. And consider the possibility that this next breath could be the most beautiful thing we experience as long as we provide it the gift of our attention and awareness fully. while still connected <clears throat> to the stillness of the body, and the silence of the speech. We feel and imagine the mind in its natural state, 
openness and warmth. And feeling a sense of the awareness that is all around us. Almost <laughs> as though we were gazing at a clear sky, that sense of spaciousness in all directions. And feeling this sense of mind as not just behind the eyes and between the ears, but the expansive nature of awareness and mind. Imbued with a natural quality of care, warmth, kindness. And now that we've settled a bit in the body, speech, and mind, in our natural states, we can turn towards this outrageous and beautiful aspiration of the bodhisattva. And consider dedicating our practice and turning our mind towards the aspiration that we could wake up for the sake of all beings. And that we commit ourselves to that practice, all beings, all time. If that vow feels too big, just consider opening the heart to care and extending whatever level of care feels right. The important piece is not just for you but for all of us. This intention might motivate us to even have our practice feel more relevant, more poignant. Just recalling and remembering the great need in this world for more compassion, more kindness, more attunement. And for just a moment, see if you can have a direct sense in the body of that aspiration of compassion. Not a concept, not words, but what does it feel? How can we experience the sense of the heart quivering and the face of suffering, that aspiration and motivation to show up? <coughs> Allowing the intention and motivation to 
kind of recede into the background while still present. And shifting our attention and awareness now to this practice of Vedana or feeling tone. We can begin by simply noticing what is the quality of sensation in this moment around the shoulders? Is there a sense of pleasantness, unpleasantness, or somewhere in between, neutral? And then directing our attention and awareness to the right pinky finger. Pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. Again, without a lot of thinking or elaboration, why it doesn't feel a certain way or why it does. Just this noticing, a simple noting. And then taking in the entire body and allowing attention and awareness to follow whatever arises. And the sensations that may come as energy is moving, maybe noticing an itch that arises, desire to shift or move our posture. And bringing this close attention, this attentiveness, is that experience or sensation pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral? You may discover or notice that these sensations we attribute to pleasant or unpleasant, there's a richness. We can really feel into that quality of unpleasant. Is it dull? Is it throbbing? Is it heavy? And similar with the pleasant, is there a warmth or a tingling? So bringing this curiosity alongside this labeling. And it could be there's a lot of neutral. The body is not having many highs or lows. Even better, just keep noticing the quality of neutral. And the subtle shifts or changes in areas that just remain steady.
When you get carried away by a thought, memory, or image, <clears throat> really notice what it's like to return to the body. And to begin again that simple, curious observation of sensations, pleasant, unpleasant, in the middle. And now we widen the sphere of our attention and awareness to include these thoughts, memories, and images that arise. Without getting engaged with them, without energizing them with our attention, the thought arises of what was that sound? And noticing, was that thought pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral? And then releasing the thought, returning to sensations in the body. So keeping our main anchor and focus, identifying and labeling sensations in the body, while also becoming aware of the thoughts that arise and noticing their feeling tone. We may even notice that a thought that arises brings with it a sensation in the body. So allowing again our attention to be so subtle, our awareness so subtle, we can really be captivated by the movements of the mind. And the subtle shifts and changes in the body.
Just a couple more moments here. Always a new opportunity to refresh our attention and awareness. And then returning to settling in the body, in the speech, in the mind, releasing any doing, no labeling, no identifying. Just feeling the stillness, inviting the silence, opening up to the warmth, spaciousness. Thank you for your practice. So part of our gathering here together is to get to be in community. You know, it would be one thing if we could all just learn by listening, but it doesn't really seem to work that way. We learn so much more by reflection And one way we can do that together is reflecting on our practice. But to do so in a way that's supportive, we make our discussion and our conversation here part of the practice. So when we're speaking, really having a sense of compassionate speech. Compassionate speech means thinking about everybody else in the room, how they might respond, thinking about what we're sharing, how we're sharing it. And then compassionate listening So being open and available to what's being said as much as possible without judgment. I know we all have discerning minds and it can be really challenging, but just to remember whatever is said in here, we just cannot even fathom the complexity of the humans in front of us and everything each of us has lived or walked up until now. So treating it as the opportunity to see everybody in this room as a Buddha, on our way to become, right? That's, that's the idea. Some of us maybe have a little more dust on the gold of our hearts, a little more work to do, depending on what day it is. But to really kind of receive that from one another in our discussions and reflections. So there's a mic here and friends online can raise their hands. But um, I think we'll, we'll probably do Vedana for a couple weeks because I think it's a practice worth unpacking more and more. So how was that? Any questions? Any reflections? What did you notice? Yes, you can pass that to Tom. Um, thank you for the practice. Mm. I felt like um, there was a it felt like that almost like that there were layers of attention it felt like that there was this very Mm. like um focused attention that almost felt a little bit like mom sort of like (laughs) what are you guys doing and then all the thoughts kind of clumped down and you know that that but it also felt very much like a kind of a a selfing kind of activity like Mm. it was me i'm focused on something yes and then of course it's very not sustainable because i've got to go do something else or Mm. or fades and, and i'm starting to get like a little um, you know, I was remembering you were talking about like sort of personal compassion versus sort of larger, I forget the exact words, but I was wondering if you would care to sort of um, help me think about, is there a sort of an analogy, like is there a larger attention that 
uh, that doesn't involve me doing something and you know switching things, switching gears and things like that? Such a great question. And so when you're saying the layers of attention, was the main one that kind of mom voice like stop doing that in there? Was there a, another quality of attention when you say different layers? Um, it felt like that the initial was very focused and very, um, you know, it just had a level, layer of punitiveness, like stop making all that noise, you know, that, that there was something about that. And then it felt like that as that kind of got a little bit exhausted. Yeah. Certainly it felt like that there was a more of a, a gentleness to it, which I think that's what helped me to think about, well, is this something like yeah. that, compa that personal compassion, which is like I can do for a short amount of time right. versus this yeah. other thing, which is, has nothing really to do with me except yeah i'm sort of here yeah yeah there are even layers and levels to that question so i'll i'll um i'll respond to it um as briefly as i can because i think we could kind of dive into it for quite a while it is really interesting to notice how we can get a, a kind of contraction when we're paying attention and we've been doing quite a lot of spacious open and awareness together so it does, it's quite a, a different feeling, right, to just be focused on it. And yet, you know, that kind of level of focused attention and, and awareness, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be that bearing down so much. There can be a quality that you were describing that you had kind of intuited that there is a way of discerning it doesn't feel <clears throat> and like noticing what's arising it doesn't feel quite so tight or so punitive and it's it is you're describing you know our our generated practice of compassion um in contrast to maybe the the field of bodhicitta or that's always around right just resting in compassion and similarly our attention it can be resting in compassion and we can identify this thought arising that thought arising, the sensation arising, without it feeling quite so kind of um, bearing down on it. I'm sure it was a better analogy, but because we're judging it, we're like pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. I think it can kind of create that charge of, oh, I shouldn't be feeling this, oh, I do like this. And so there is kind of um, an interesting opportunity to even see and, and notice like what is our, our default way of monitoring ourselves and that interdisciplinarian, right? That's what the mom voice sounds like to me. And the only advice, I mean, I could kind of opine on it uh, for a while. The advice is, can you be more relaxed in the attention, right? And, and that's existential relaxed, but actually, honestly, usually it's like a relax and then noticing, right? Because we just, we have that kind of tendency to, to fall into it. Um, but yeah, I'll be curious how it unfolds in the weeks to come too, because it is, you know, meta awareness, which is why I've had a job ever uh, in the field of contemplative science. Meta awareness, it's trainable. We can really improve our ability to recognize thoughts and emotions. Thank God, right? And because of that, there's like some hope of freedom from, uh, as Shantideva would call it, emotional slavery not just being pulled here and yanked back there. He says, it's like my limbless enemies, you know, they give me more pain than any other could. And he's talking about his emotions, right? Um, you know, they track you down throughout the night, you know, they have so much more stamina than any enemy could, you know, these difficult thoughts and feelings. So when we develop meta-awareness, we're starting to recognize our thoughts and the feelings as they arise. And we could do that as a disciplinarian. It wouldn't be a problem, but it'd be so much nicer to do it as a kind of compassionate guardian, a, you know, someone who's accompanying. So maybe even just that orientation. Thank yeah. For so deep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, so struggling with a little bit of job search induced anxiety, and so trying to couple my breathing with my heart rate, mm. which I really have been struggling with lately. Mm. So appreciated your comment earlier on kind of tenderizing the heart. Mm. So I guess um, when trying to balance out breathing and, and your heart, um, mm. is it 
I guess, appropriate to go and think about like the compassion concepts you've been talking about. Yeah. But then I don't know, I might do too much thinking to get it calm, or is that okay to do? And just thinking about some ways to, um, I mean, coming here and definitely helps decrease the anxiety and, and yeah. really helps that. But yeah. Just maybe thoughts on um, mediating breath and heart rate. Um, is it okay to start thinking a lot about it or just try to empty out and, and go with the flow? So. Thank you for that and sorry for the anxiety. <laughs> you know, um, to, yeah, totally know it, totally live in that world often. And yeah, so I'm curious when you're saying, is this particular to this practice or in general right now, just ruminative thoughts? Yeah, more in general for now. Yeah, and so when ruminative thoughts arise, I think is, the question is, should I just focus on the breath or open to compassion? Is that? Yes. Oh, yeah, great question. Uh, I mean, I really don't think there is like a, a ceiling for how much compassion you can include in your practice, truly. And sometimes, especially depending on the emotion and depending on how close it is to our like survival fear or how close that's getting tugged for us. And that could be in a personal relationship, in a work situation, in housing. Um, we really need so much soothing and emotion regulation to be able to practice at all. And so even, you know, you can go absolutely as far as both hands on the chest. And maybe you don't need to be there the whole practice. But just as that like visceral, there's actually oxytocin released when you put your hands on your chest like this, or whatever you need, right? And there was that old, I don't know if folks remember, it was like a, you know, fake hug is like tighten your seatbelt, you know, so it feels like you're getting hugged, which is kind of sad. But like, <laughs> whatever means necessary to feel loved, you know, and just that, that sense of soothing. And this was, you know, a lot of these practices, they're so beautiful of like, kind of calling in um, these deities or these gurus to be with us. Part of it is that we merge our mind with them or we imagine ourselves as them. And part of it is like calling in our crew to be around us. And I, I don't think you were here when we were doing the retrieving from nature practices, but um, you know, we can also at the beginning of our practice kind of like prime. So imagine a place in which we feel held in love. And that might be a person or a home or, Right, and I think I've joked, but often when my cats walk through my practice, it's like loving kindness. It's like, ah, and then I can relax into it. And so I, I really think, you know, doing that, like deliberate calling in of compassion. And so, you know, the, the beautiful practice of mantra, kind of it's a, a, a mind protector. It's called that often. And that could just be, I'm gonna be okay. You know, I got this. Like anything simple that we can silently to ourselves say and then return to practice. So I really recommend like for everyone when you're going through loss, acute difficulty, rumination, anxiety, to kind of titrate with those cues of compassion that then can help us be in the practice. We might not need to be the whole practice of compassion because often focusing on attention will help us with the meta-awareness and help kind of get some clearing in our mind and feel more focused, but just to feel like there, yeah, there's no upper limit to bringing that in. Beautiful question. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Hi, Hi welcome back too. Oh, so, oh yeah, friend online first, please. I can't That's see a, your name from that far away. Will you say it? Victor. Okay, Victor. nice to see you. Nice to see you, Victor. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, well, two comments. So, um, one of them is related to how I feel when I meditate. Um, I'm very comfortable uh, trying, and usually I feel very relaxed, and I find myself going uh, deeper and deeper into relaxation. Um, in the process, like tonight, I observe my thoughts, but um, I think at this point, I try not to judge what I'm thinking. So I just observe my thoughts without really giving it a label, whether it be right or wrong. My goal is just to observe it and that's it. But I think the area where I need help is um, that I'm going into more and more relaxation that it's hard at some point just to bring myself back uh, yes. to awareness. 
So that's yes. one common. And the other one uh, is related to right speech. Um, so the example I'm going to give you may make you laugh, but it's just to give you the context. So now um, I find myself trying more purposely to engage into Buddhist practice. And I think just by having that idea, I find myself um, more committed to my own self and journey. And in the process, um, so I've been reading a little bit about the basics of Buddhism. And last night I watched the presidential debate and that's where the right speech comes to mind. So um, so I, I watched it and I was in total disagreement with the gentleman on the other side. Um, but when I came, when I went to work today, I was the immediate rush to be myself and disparage this person. Yeah. But because lately I've been trying to be more purposeful, purposeful in my practice, the first thing that came to mind is right speech. Mm. And so, um, I think for a second, I had the awareness to say, I could be very passionate and say my genuine thoughts about this person, but because I'm trying to change that behavior, I remember right speech and I stopped myself. So I didn't talk about it. And so no questions tonight, just do comments. Thank you. <laughs> I think you did have a question though, but thank you. I will, um, yeah, just just to say, you know, engaging in these um, in these practices of right speech and like also, of course, um, right action and really seeing the impact of our practice in our everyday life is so powerful and so affirming. It's really hard to do, really challenging. So. A wonderful opportunity. You were asking about this, like staying bright during practice. And I really do think, um, of course, whatever meditation um, I'm guiding, it's up to you to take the cues or not. But if you are struggling with brightness, labeling might help because it is something that you're kind of putting in. Also, uh, in this room, it's really full. And so I don't always, unless we're settling the mind in its natural state, I don't invite us to have eyes open because it can be a little too stimulating, but I practice eyes open mostly. So that's a great way to keep brightness. Thank you. Yes, nice to see you. You too. Uh, so I had a great practice, thank you. Um, I was feeling different emotions in different parts of the body. Mm. That was interesting because I was feeling a little bit of sorrow in my heart because of family. Mm. And then, but in my head, it was like very like bright and it felt great. Mm. So are you, you know, when you're labeling and going through that, are you kind of scanning through your body? Because I'm, I'm used to doing the body scanning. Yeah. Or are you just aware of the entire body? Yeah. Great question. Both. Um, it's, it's such an interesting practice, Vedna. I was listening to, I don't know, I've probably listened to five or six Vedna practices over the last couple of days, and there's quite a big range. So it can really be just part of a body scan, where as you're scanning, you're also doing the Vedana. And, um, you know, the parts, it's interesting because you'll have some teachers really strong, and, and I agree that it shouldn't just be the body. We should also be really doing mental formation or like the thoughts that arise. Um, and it is, and then, because then you get this amazing opportunity. Anybody notice a thought arising and then the sensation in the body? It's like, you're like, wow. I mean, it's kind of no duh, but still it's kind of a revelation to recognize how much causal efficacy our thoughts have. Like they matter, right? It's not just something happening here. Like it's impacting our entire autonomic nervous system. <laughs> and like recognizing that and being able to, like I had a really pleasant thought arise and I was like, oh yeah, I'm just, yeah, that's great. Just noticing, right? Not, not, not holding on, but just like my entire body can enjoy and rejoice. And then something unpleasant, you're like, God, that really feels terrible, right? And letting it go. So, so you're yeah, I mean, you, you can, when they co-arise, yeah. yeah, yeah. It definitely helped dissipate the feelings. The Wonderful, feelings. yeah, yeah, and I do think, you know, we do, we do have a lot of, 
emotional material stored in the subtle body, especially according to like Tibetan and traditions and Chinese medicine. So to find and release or unblock this full natural flow of energy in the body, that is the goal. Not to get rid of our feelings per se, but to just let them move naturally as they will, unless we're like, nope, don't wanna feel it, nope, don't wanna feel it. And then we get kind of all, you know, um, tied up internally, so yeah. Thank you. Maybe just one more, yeah. Elizabeth has her hand up. Elizabeth has had her hand up. Okay, Elizabeth, hi, nice to see you. Nice to see you too. <laughs> so um, I wanted to, to I had, um, <clears throat> sorry, um, a comment and a question. The comment was um, earlier the gentleman was talking about the, um, the kind of um, chastising mother um, to, 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 to move his attention back. And, and I thought it was interesting because I had that experience as well. It's, and, and the more stressed I am, the more frequently that occurs, like, yeah. you know, with what's going on in my life. And so I was trying to like work with that, like maybe work around it. And, and then I was like, this isn't working. What is going on? And then I realized this is during the entire practice. This is not like an instant, um, <laughs> this evening, but, um, and then I realized that actually it's um, a part of me actually is scared that I'm not going to engage in the practice if that chastising voice isn't there yeah. to tell me right. to move back. And yeah. so, right. So when I recognized that and was like, okay, so like, let me put some things into place and we'll see how this <laughs> And like mm. it, that really helped <laughs> me be able to, it didn't go away completely because, you know, it's a process, but <laughs> I was able to, to give that need compassion. Yeah. And that made Beautiful. a huge difference in, in yeah. my experience of the meditation. Um, Amazing. So I just wanted to, to share that to follow up on his comment. And then my question was, um, so, so, um, Thanks to you, I wasn't with you when you read it, but I came in and, and you talked about it um, when I was first starting here and um, the uh, true path to healing. Mm. And um, so I, I started that like a month or so ago and um, I identified spaciousness as the element I've needed to most focus on. And it was a good thing because I'm in the process of moving out of state and confronting the very real cost, like dollars and cents of things. Mm. And so I kind of thought that was what it was. But but then this weekend, um, the most spacious change I have felt was when um, my ex started to release me from like the relationship. And so I was curious, like, I mean, it was like, I could physically feel lighter and more spacious in my chest. It became easier to get things done and move forward. And so um, I was, I was curious because that's not something that you, that I necessarily have control of. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so are there, do you have suggestions in practice or in, even if there's like, do you have suggestions on how to try to move through that and cultivate that in myself in a way that isn't dependent on the other person's or other people's timelines boy million dollar question <laughs> there's like seven thousand apps for that <laughs> none of them work <laughs> um <laughs> uh but first elizabeth i just want to like yeah like super excited for you in in that insight that arose during practice so this is not necessarily an insight practice though when we are aware of vedana like when we start to recognize feeling tone something like you're describing can arise where we see like wow the way i talk to myself is toxic <laughs> like i'm not gonna do that what if i just put that part or that experience of myself over here and that's why, you know, it's so tough with meditation and starting to actually have a greater sense of our internal voices and the garbage dump of our mind. And we're like, why am I doing this? Like, it was fine when I was suppressing everything. This is horrible. <laughs> 
but or and the opportunity as you describe to recognize it and kind of you know thanks for your duty like move on right yeah. over and over and over with compassion that is freedom that's our path to freedom so really beautiful to hear that um and then with spaciousness and and for folks here we we did Wangel Rinpoche's book of retrieving from these natural elements and the element of space which is this kind of all accommodating openness the recommendation is to make a date with space and so that can be you know finding somewhere you can really gaze freely and openly and feeling inviting that quality you know within yourself and then in practice you kind of you remember that like what is it like to be at the very edge of the horizon and see the ocean and see the sky and especially if you're leaving um, the state to get yourself some ocean time and you know feel that and then be able to call upon it so that would be Rinpoche's uh, suggestion for that I've been doing sky gazing um which is definitely helpful um and and I have my my road trip plan is to like be very intentional about places that I stop to 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 help me in that progression um but I guess my, my, my question or curiosity is around like the, the, the personal relationship part. That oh yeah. That, I don't that have I, control over, but that I felt yeah. a difference. Like I could physically feel space opening up. Yeah. In just a simple way, we definitely don't control other people right. and they make a huge difference in our life and our heart and our mind. And there's not, there's no, there's no technique uh, to kind of shift or change the impact that other people have in our life. Okay. All we can do is work with our own heart and mind and reactivity. So no practice for that per se, other than continue to be cultivating compassion for oneself and finding that space for openness. So, so that wish you luck in that. Of my turn. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You decided no. He might, he might address your question. Okay. <laughs> we'll see. Um, so I want to, so thank you everyone for your questions and responses. Always thank you Coco for your practice. Mm -hmm. you could feel that. And where we stopped last week, as folks might remember was, you know, kind of the way that even that we bring our mind and our attention to receive teachings and information. Um, Ulysses, did you want to come in here and sit? You want to lurk out there in the back? You're, sitting, you're good? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and this idea that we can bring like a mind or like quality of mind to every interaction and this analogy of the three pots and just, I feel like it's so rich. It's just worth mentioning uh, one more time that, you know, we can have these pots that feel the three pots of the one that's over full the one that has poison in it and the one that has a hole in it and this one that's over full it's like we've already gone to so many different sources of knowledge so many workshops so many youtube channels so many apps that we can't even receive anything new right so when thinking of the quality of our attentiveness and then there's the one with poison in it and that's you know kind of what um victor was saying of it's so easy to just speak poorly have judgment, feel negativity, blame, right? So the quality of our attention, we can show up like, oh, this is already bad. No, this is, this is no good. It's not going to work for me. Like that kind of experience. And then the pot with the hole in it, you're so distracted, <laughs> so distracted. And nothing even like can be held. So it's not just applying our attention. It's the quality of attention that we're bringing. And, you know, with these three pots, it's it's more of a, I'd say kind of diagnostic tool, like what am I, how am I showing up, right, for my life, for others, for the things that matter, and uh, reflecting on that at this, what's kind of in the way of us developing this attention. And there's a, you know, this, this whole piece here, Shanti Deva is on, he really wants to emphasize how important it is for us to practice now. He says, today, indeed, I'm hale and hearty. 
I have enough to eat and I'm without affliction. And yet this life is fleeting and deceptive. This body is briefly lent to me. And kind of that, you know, we shouldn't wait to practice, you know, our training our heart and our mind until things are really bad. In fact, we have to do it now. It's so deceptive. We get kind of too complacent when things are favorable for us. Um, so he says, and yet the way I act is such that I shall not regain a human life and losing this, my precious human form. Um, here is now the chance for wholesome deeds. If I fail now to accomplish virtue, what will be my lot? What shall I do? Um, and then he gives this kind of famous analogy. This is why Buddha has declared that like a turtle that perchance can place its head within a yoke adrift upon a shoreless sea, this human birth is difficult to find. So you might <clears throat> know this analogy, you know, this turtle, um, these ancient kind of tortoise turtles that come up once supposedly every 99 years for a breath. And it's as rare as imagining that turtle coming up for its one breath. And then there happened to be like a little like circle, a wooden circle that's just resting upon the ocean waters and that its head came up through it for the breath. That's how rare human life is. <laughs> so we really, you know, just unbelievably, unfathomably rare. So this is his kind of, <clears throat> kind of beseeching us, you know, this human life, it's so important. And I love what um, Pema Chodron offers here, that when we're not kind of paying attention to that which gets in the way of us bringing attentiveness, kind of when we get kind of caught up. So Shantideva starts this chapter by talking about all the ways we can kind of get pulled away by self-centered attachment from caring about others, being attentive to others, and that we really don't see the ongoing impact of our attentiveness falling away. We're like, oh, I'm just focusing on myself for a while. Like, what's the big deal? Yeah, Bodhisattva vow, maybe next month. And she's saying that all these patterns that pull us away from Bodhisattva activity, they also make our life miserable. Like, it's not that it's going so well when we're self-centered, right? There's also its own misery. And she says, there is a repeating pattern to our behavior that we somehow seem to miss. When we're challenged, our habitual reactions are especially predictable. We strike out or withdraw, we scream or weep, we become arrogant or feel inadequate. These strategies for seeking security and avoiding discomfort only increase our uneasiness. They seem addictive. Even though the results are unsatisfactory, we use them again and again. But attentiveness functions like a guardian who protects us from repeating the same mistakes and strengthening the same patterns. We can catch ourselves from getting hooked and being swept away. So I love that invitation over and over in the text. It's not just practice these in order for you to be of service to all beings. It's practice these to be a more sane human being for yourself and all those around you. Um, so next here, oh, there's some really beautifully dramatic uh, verses coming up here that I just love so much. Thus, having found reprieve from all of these things, if I now fail to train myself in virtue, what greater folly could there ever be? How more could I betray myself? So this idea that, you know, that we actually get this precious human birth, that we're here and available, there's, there's almost, you know, nothing harder that we could do than to try to avoid the Bodhisattva path. Because the Bodhisattva path, not only is it opening our heart to other beings, but it's a full attitude that everything I'm doing, that's, you know, beneficial, I offer it up. But also every difficulty and challenge I experience, I use it as fuel for the fire. So this Bodhisattva attitude means that when we experience hardship, loss, grief, uncertainty, we're say, wow, this is so much in service to me helping understand the difficulty of life of other beings. Instead of kind of closing inward and feeling like we're alone, like no one else understands, this is so uniquely horrible to me. Like the Bodhisattva attitude gives us so much more space. Um, 
And then uh, Pema Chodron gets into here, this idea that art, like Shanti Deva will say, my mind is tormented, burns in flame of infinite regret. This idea that if we're not kind of, if we're giving into these habitual patterns of our difficult emotions, that we're just going to, at the end of our life, right, right when death meets us, we're going to wonder, why didn't I pay more attention? Why didn't I practice more to open my heart? And she says, Shanti Deva is talking about the destructive power of negative emotions and the ways that they enslave us when we strengthen them. And from here on, um, he discusses the need to be attentive to our aggression, our craving, our ignorance, our jealousy, our arrogance, and all of their offspring. <laughs> so he says here, um, the state so hard to find wherein to help myself. And now when freedom, power of choice is mine, if once again I'm led away to hell, I am as if benumbed by sorcery, my mind reduced to total impotence with no perception of the madness overwhelming me. Oh, what has me in its grips? Anger, lust, these enemies of mine are limbless and devoid of faculties. They have no bravery, no cleverness. How, they, how then have they reduced me to such slavery? Right, this idea that um, our difficult and destructive emotions, anger, lust, that they have no limbs, they have no eyes and voice, no bravery, they're not clever, right? They're so base and yet they just keep us all the way under. And then he says, it is I who welcome them within my heart, allowing them to harm me at their pleasure. I who suffer all without resentment, thus my abject patience all displaced. And this is such an important point here. It's, you know, indeed our emotions arise without our control or our desire, unless we specifically choose to listen to a certain song that makes us sad or watch something that makes us happy. But this idea that you know, our emotions are kind of arising without our choice, but we welcome them. And this is a point I love that Pema Chodron makes is we have to realize that we like our kleshas. There is an addictive quality to being kind of, you know, tied up in our anxieties and our worries. It, it's familiar. It feels like we're protecting ourselves. Um, she says, hatred, for example, can make us feel strong and in charge. Rage makes us feel even more powerful and invulnerable. Craving and wanting can feel soothing, romantic, and nostalgic. We weep over lost loves or unfulfilled dreams. It's painfully and deliciously bittersweet. Therefore, we don't even consider interrupting the flow. Ignorance is oddly comforting. We don't have to do anything. We just lay back and we don't relate to what's happening around us. So this idea, you know, she kind of, um, a likens in the next uh, paragraph here that, you know, letting these emotions in is like a powerful drug. And one that without that attentiveness of mind, they just kind of run us all over the place and can really disturb our well being. And as some of you know, in this room, you know, I'm, I'm a researcher of emotion, I'm a second generation researcher, I love emotions, I'm on board. And they really, they can show us everywhere that we're stuck. That's one of their main, you know, important values. They can show us what matters to us, but that doesn't mean we just kind of get pulled by every whim, by every experience. We do have to learn how to be in right relationship with our emotions as they arise. He says, no other enemy indeed has lived so long as my defiled emotions. O oh, enemy, afflictive passion, endless and beginningless companion. All other foes that I appease and wait upon will show me favors, give me every aid. But should I serve my dark, defiled emotions, they will only harm me, draw me down to grief. And so he's not deliberately saying, get rid of your emotions, because good luck, but get rid of, you know, kind of hanging on to them getting hooked by them. So the kleshas are the difficult emotions, but the shempa is the charge. 
And many of us, we look for this like high intensity charge, right? There's something really enjoyable about the gossip around the election, right? Contempt, anger, despair, you know, it can feel really enjoyable. And I actually, you know, I, I do think a little healthy gossip has its place, I'm just gonna say. <laughs> Especially when it's community building, it's all about the intention. May I gossip about this for the sake of all beings, <laughs> starting here, deepening my connection. But we really, we have to become so clear, you know, and this is in the next chapter, this beautiful line where he talks about the sentinels that guard the, you know, the gate, the gateway to the mind. And mindfulness and these practices of attention, they do, they help us kind of create this gateway so that not everything is coming in and staying and it's like, how do we practice that discernment of where we are allowing our mind to spend time? And this is before, right? This is all of these thoughts and kind of the carrying us away, these defiled emotions, even before we had access to all the human suffering in the world at all time, right? This is just within the context of the eighth century consciousness. Um, he says, therefore, if these long lived ancient enemies of mine the wellspring only of increasing woe can find their lodging safe within my heart. What joy or peace in this world can be found? So again, that tie back. We want to be able to become aware of these difficult emotions because when we are emotionally overwrought, we are not available for others. Even when we're so caught up in how bad I am, like, oh God, I feel so insecure and things are so hard. And so it's not like these big aggrandizing emotions that take us away from caring about others. All of our big emotional experiences that we get hooked on, that we continue to ruminate on, they prevent us from being available to others and they make our life hell. <laughs> it's like a two for one, right? And so this idea of how do we get very curious and very committed to liberating ourselves from this, as he would say, from being imprisoned by our difficult emotions. I wish there was one simple way to do it, but I do think, you know, the way this book is organized, like continuing to invite us to both these qualities of clearing our mind, finding stable attention, and really tenderizing the heart and opening the heart. Like those are the two pathways we're strengthening at all times. And I think part of this chapter is like, let's get really clear on the impact and the cost of these emotions. I think I've shared this before, a poem by my teacher that I love so much. There's a line in it that says, let's stop making deals for a safe passage. There isn't one anyway, and the cost is too high. So this idea, you know, for me, I, I like to hang out in fear. Anybody else fear? Okay, oh wow, what do we got, anger, anybody? <laughs> Despair, okay, the rest of you, I'm worried. <laughs> but you know, these emotions that we're so familiar with, this idea like fear is such a core emotion for many of us and you know, trying to make a deal for a safe passage is trying to avoid a world in which we experience fear. There isn't one anyway and the cost is too high. You know, trying to avoid what makes us afraid means we're not fully living our life. We're not available for life. That cost is too high. And we still don't avoid hard things, right? By pulling ourselves out. So when I read these, I mean, I, I just love the drama of Shantideva, you know? And if the jail guards of the prisons of samsara, the butchers and tormentors of the infernal realms all lurk within me in the web of craving, what joy can be my destiny? But this whole invitation is see the cost. See the cost of these difficult emotions. Recognize there's a cost for all beings, but recognize the cost for you. So bringing kind of a mindfulness. And so in the Vedana practice, we're doing this at the subtlest level. Unpleasant, don't like it. But then that gets blown up all to like, oh man, I, I really don't like, um, I don't like um, trying to think of a big, a bigger, drama. I don't like politics, uh, which is completely reasonable. <clears throat> but these bigger kind of aversions and these bigger kind of um, prisons that we put ourselves in of, I hate our political system. It's so fucked up and dysfunctional and whatever. Nothing's going to change and it's awful. 
completely reasonable thought to have. But when we let ourselves live in that way of seeing and thinking, every time something comes up, oh, this is terrible, this is horrible, we're, we're enslaved under that emotion. And it kind of comes from just that first little unpleasant, don't like the quality of that thought, right? So we're starting with the subtle so that we can notice these larger mental formations, these habits, these often, you know, we don't even see the ways that we've built up biases and blame, especially towards parts of our life, towards the world, towards others. So we actually need these, these practices of attentiveness to help us come in. Okay, so I'm gonna read just a couple more of these. I will not leave the fight before my eyes, these enemies of mine, until these enemies of mine are all destroyed. For it's aroused to fury by the merest slight, incapable of sleep until the scores are settled. Foolish rivals, both to suffer when they die, will draw battle lines and do their best to win. And careless of the pain, cut and thrust, will stand their ground, refusing to give way. No need to say that I will not lose heart. Regardless of the hardships of the fray, these natural foes today I strive to crush, these enemies, the source of all my pain. And Pema Chodron says he has these very strong kind of war-like metaphors um, because he's coming from a warrior tradition. That's where he comes. And, and I really like, you know, the amount of times I've heard people say, I I'd like to practice compassion, but, you know, I need to be strong. And this kind of duality that's created, but this idea of being a warrior of compassion, right? Seeing so clearly, understanding actually the root of our struggles and difficulties, and then refusing to engage. I mean, it's so hard to not engage with our despair and our fear, with our shame. Like this is warriorship. Compassion is nothing less than warriorship. So that's a little inspiration from Shanti Deva. So let's take a moment to dedicate our practice here. So coming back to settle the body, speech, and mind. And seeing if we can take one really full, slow, deep breath in. And slow, deep breath out. And again, considering this possibility that our, our time here together generates some benefit. Our attention, our connection, And then we immediately offer that benefit up. This is the attitude or the orientation of the Bodhisattva, offering up all the good. And so placing hands together at the heart, if that feels natural and comfortable, in the symbolic gesture, offering up any benefit of this practice. And with the hope and aspiration that all beings could know peace and ease. All beings could feel love and belonging. That all beings of all time could be completely free. Thanks everyone for your practice, <clears throat> wonderful to be together.